evening. We'll, uh, we'll uh, say a prayer, and then we'll worship, and we'll study the Word of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, uh, even on a day like this, that we still get to gather and just worship, Lord, and study your Word and be together. We pray your blessing upon this evening. In Jesus' name.
Ready if everyone's got their tea and stuff. We're not actually streaming tonight. We've got no internet here in the building, but I think we're still going to record it so we can put it up at a later date. It also means there'll be no Bible text on the screen because that's an online software we use for that. So uh, you'll all need your Bibles in front of you, which I can see you've all got. Well done. Yes. It means you have to actually uh, open them, I'm afraid, <laughs> rather than using the, the screen. Let's pray and then we'll get into this. Heavenly Father, we just ask now as we... Uh, we, we pick up in this book of Isaiah, Lord, that you would open our eyes to, to see the wonderful truths in the remainder of this chapter, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, so we, we didn't do it last week, I think it was the week before, but we've been in this chapter now for four. This is the fourth session in this chapter. It's just a long chapter. Uh, there's a lot in it, but we are going to finish it hopefully this evening, and then we'll take a break over August a little bit and pick it up in chapter 41 after that but let me just give you a little bit of context by way of reminder before we just jump into the middle of the chapter remember chapter 40 marked the transition of the book of isaiah from really from rebuke and judgment and warning in the first 39 chapters to one of comfort and consolation from chapter 40 uh, really until the end it's like this so uh, the comfort for israel that we really looked at was that statement in verse 9 Last, uh, last time we looked, we were in verse 9. It says, here is your God, or behold your God. 
Isaiah is giving reasons for Israel to be comforted, and the one that he really points to is because of God, basically. You have God. It's very similar to what we studied on Sunday, actually. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold your God, behold the Lamb of God. Very similar. But in this section, we're, we're hearing the prophet relay all of these reasons for Israel's comfort. And last time, remember, the God of Israel described himself as a shepherd. And that was the reason that he could be, they could be comforted. He was a shepherd, one who will gather the flock and tend for them. And of course, we, we spoke of the, the fulfillment of that in Jesus Christ, who is the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, uh, and how he, the Messiah fill, fulfills those things for Israel. So now Isaiah continues extolling, really, just the greatness of God. Uh, and the nation uh, will take comfort from that. We'll pick it up in verse 12. Verse 12, he says, now remember, this is Isaiah speaking to the nation, uh, giving them reasons to be comforted. So verse 12, he says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales? So Isaiah asks a number of almost kind of rhetorical questions in this section that all have to do with the greatness of God. The emphasis here is really on his power. He is the God of creation, recalling all of the Genesis accounts where God spoke everything into existence. It says he measures the waters uh, in the hollow of his hand, or the measures, measures the heavens by the span of his hand. That basically means the palm of his hand. That's the idea there. So this is what we would call anthropomorphism. This is when you use human characteristics, obviously, to describe something that, that doesn't have those characteristics, but it gives us a way of understanding it. Uh, hopefully, you all understand the use, the literary use of that. It seems uh, quite obvious in this context here. He's using these human characteristics so that we can understand. So you think of our hand, we can barely cradle a cup of water in our hands, can we, uh, if you just do that? But the idea is he's saying, here, all the waters on the earth uh, fit in the, the palm of God's hands. The idea is to express how great and how large and how awesome God is and that he has authority over all of creation. It says he marked off the heavens by the span. That's usually from your little finger to your thumb if you do that. That's like a span, that's sort of a size there. This is quite an amazing statement. You see, back then when Isaiah was writing, they could really see the heavens. They knew they were large. They did used to try and count the stars and things like that, but they, they knew it was uh, obviously vast but they really had no idea how vast, it, did they? Uh, we know now uh, the universe is so large that we can't really even comprehend it. You know, through these telescopes, galaxy upon galaxy upon galaxy, millions of them, like numbers that can't even get our heads around, yet it's described here, and it doesn't matter how large it is to us that we might think that's amazing to God, it's just described as fitting in between his little fit, yeah, just in the palm of his hand. Again, it's just a way of emphasizing that we might think this is large, but to God it's just... It's just what he created. It's, no, it's not large, it's nothing. It's just part of part fits in his hand. It says he calculated the dust of the earth by the measure. And again, you can imagine that, uh, something that is just impossible to do. If you think of sand and dust and everything. It's one of these things that we have no idea how many grains of sand there are, how much dust there is or anything like that. But these things are all known to God. It says weigh the hills and the mountains. He weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scale. Basically, the idea is he, he knows all things about the earth and he has power over all of them. He created all of them and he has all knowledge over all these things. The awesome power and greatness of God is to be a comfort for Israel. Remember, it's all in the context of being a comfort for Israel because he is their God. And if you were in the midst of a rather wild Middle East situation and you had one empire just defeated that had been on your north but you came very close to destruction and you'd heard about this rising new empire that was going to come and take you into captivity at some point, you would take comfort in knowing the fact that the God of Israel is the one who created everything. Uh, and he is on your team. He is, the, he is your God, basically. You're named after him in that respect. That is a comfort. And that is also a comfort for us today, too. Uh, we can claim that same comfort. And when we think of all the things that go on in our life, the problems in our lives, in the same way, we can think he can do all of that. There's nothing really that he can't handle. So this is the first part of their comfort, the greatness of God. Verse 13 and 14, it says, Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or who, as his counsellor, has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? 
and who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding. So again, remember, these are like rhetorical questions. He's asking about God's wisdom. He is great in wisdom, is the emphasis of this section here. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Of course, no one except the Lord. That's the whole point. He doesn't get manipulated by anyone or swayed by anyone in that respect. There is no human counsellor that could give direction to God. He is the mighty counsellor, as Isaiah has already so eloquently explained to us earlier in the book. He does not need to consult anyone. That's what the question is getting at. Who has he consulted? No one. No one could give him any additional wisdom, any additional knowledge that he does not already possess. He needs no one to improve on his own understanding of everything that he created. That is God. That is a comforting fact again. And it's something we need to think about. Because I think if we're, if we're honest, how often do we really try and tell God what he should do? Like, our great ideas, this is, how, this is how it should all pan out, this is where I want my life to go, this is what's happening, and we pray to that effect, and quite often, simply, although you know, we're well-meaning, I think, in all of our intentions often, but it does amount to little more than trying to tell God what you want and expecting him to do it. And that's a completely backward scenario uh, when we have a God who knows all things and, and has ordered all things as he would. The Lord is great in wisdom. This is, again, a comfort. And I always think about it in the relation, the context that is given here of Israel and their current situation, the future promises that they have, but the still looming judgment uh, for their sins that are going to come. Verse 15, 16, it says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Now, see, the next part now is the greatness is presented in comparison between men and nations and the Lord, showing us that there is this vast chasm, you could say, between God and man, because he is high and lifted up, he is mighty, he is holy, and we are not. Of course, we are created beings, he is the transcendent creator. Now, think... A large, vast, powerful empire can be quite impressive. If you've ever seen an army march, you've ever seen these kind of things, all the pomp and ceremony that mankind can do, it can be quite glorious in many ways, can be impressive. Nations love to show their strength. Military parades, coronations, these sorts of things have been going on for a long time. And you think about when it was done by ancient empires that were not nation states, whereas they controlled vast swaths of land and people and they had a lot of show and might to boast about. And what it's basically saying here is, in light of that, compared to the glory of the Lord, even the, the most powerful empire in the world is insignificant. And the way it describes it there, look, a drop from a bucket. That's like our expression, a drop in the ocean. Yeah, you've heard that? It's the same point, same, same expression, really. Basically, it's saying it's something so small and insignificant to the larger thing, it makes no difference. Just one drop in the ocean makes no difference, does it? That, that, that's the idea that is being said here. A speck of dust on the scales. Again, same sort of point. Insignificant to the measuring. A speck of dust on the scales. That's what we have uh, being expressed by these questions here. The verse 16, it says, Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beast enough for a burnt offering. This is the, the context Lebanon. You, you might notice whenever you see, quite often in the Bible, Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon. You hear that expression, won't you? Lebanon, Lebanon was renowned for its great forests, remarkable massive cedar trees. And because of the massive forest, it was a haven uh, for the beasts, the wildlife. It was, it was a, a lush place and it had this reputation. What he's saying here is that even all the cedar trees of Lebanon and all the beasts that contain in it, if they were to be burnt as a burnt offering, would not be enough to be worthy of the Lord. Any, you, could, you could do anything. You could end a sacrifice after sacrifice. Work. None of these things are fit for the Lord. Your efforts are nothing. And then it says the nations are as nothing. Now remember this is in the context really primarily of Babylon uh, and it is in the context of comfort for the nation of Israel. So the nation of Israel, remember, are a small nation really compared to the empires that are around them and they know that the Babylonian captivity, Isaiah is obviously speaking for the future when that, that he has told them that is going to come. But they can still take comfort in the fact that even the mighty Babylonian empire is really just as a grasshopper to the Lord. So again, if they're with the God of Israel, then they don't need to worry about those things. Even the mightiest empire of the day, in all of their pride and arrogance and rebellion against God, 
and all, all their worship of false gods like Assyria did, like Babylon did, it's less than nothing to God. Notice, it's not nothing, it's less than nothing. As in, it's, you know, it's not nothing to worry about, it's less than nothing to worry about. As in, it doesn't even concern him, because this is God, this is how, how far and great he is. And I could, you, you, we could apply this to our own day, it equally applies. We look around the world today, don't we, often, and we look at all the... Not, not, not empires may be in the same way, but the nations and the, the ideologies, the organisations, the movements, all of them with their plotting and their scheming, it seems, against the Lord's people, with all of their, their things that are meant for our harm, that are meant to deceive and take us away from the Lord. Again, we can apply that to the same way. We must remember this truth from Isaiah. All of those things, the system of the Antichrist, his kingdom, all those kind of things, there is a grasshopper to the Lord. And he'll prove that when he returns one day in the sky and simply breathes away the most powerful being that we've ever seen on this earth other than Jesus Christ. They're nothing to him, insignificant, less than nothing. That's the greatness of God. Let's look at verse 18. It says, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. Oh. Now, I like these few verses. A few times in this book, you notice you sensed Isaiah's, I want to say sense of humour, but he almost sarcastically mocks things, you know, to make his point. And he's kind of doing that here. His point is obviously to emphasise that God is unique and God is living, there is nothing really that can compare to him, utterly unique, incomparable, without equal, without even anything close. Reminds me of Psalm 89. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord? It's very similar. It's kind of Isaiah reads a bit like a psalm, a similar type of language. That was at Psalm 89, making that same point. Isaiah here is mocking the utter folly of lowly man trying to fashion their own gods with idols, basically. I mean, if you think about this, think how many people all over the world, still to this day, uh, not, not just in the ancient world, bow down to idols. They go to statues, don't they, to carvings that they've made. They have them in their home. I've seen many of these um, little statues of, of, of half-animal, half-creature type gods that they bow down to, they worship, that they burn incense to. Think about this from God's perspective. In light of the description of God that we've just seen, all wisdom, all knowing, all powerful, all creator, measures, knows everything about everything and all these sorts of things, and then he sees the folly of man and they're carving little things and bowing down and worshipping to them. And, and I think Isaiah here, is, he's mocking. And he even goes further because he says, at least the rich, he kind of makes his point, the rich can make an idol of gold at least, you know, at least that's something. They're using, they're using gold and crafts and silver and that sort of thing. But then he says, look, the impoverished, they must go to the forest and they just have to pick a tree. That's all, that's all they, they can do. And his, his point is, and you've got to be careful when you pick your tree. You don't want to pick a tree that's going to rot, do you? You don't want your idol, you don't want your God to, to rot when you bring him back into your house. Um, and Isaiah is obviously, I believe, pointing out the, the sheer absurdity of this sort of mindset. Yet, it was common in the ancient world, it's just as common today in many places around the world. This, I believe, is because, as Augustine once said, man is incurably religious. We, have the, we, we were made to worship something, and in a void of God, men will find something to worship, or Satan will give them something to worship. The deceptions of their own mind is why we see these things, and it's why we see these things in false religions, obviously, uh, primarily. And this is, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's just an sh interesting thought when you look at it like this. Men do it all the time. And still often, you'll notice, the representation of men's idols does still depend on their wealth. You go into a poor house and it's a usually, a, 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 and a, just literally, it's a carving of wood, isn't it? Something carved out of wood or a cheap statue. Or think of some of those cheap statues of Mary's that you see around. You go to a, you go to a, rich, a, a rich idol worshipper and often their idols are a little more impressive. They've made palaces and rooms and marble and gold and these sorts of things. It's the same thing that Isaiah's talking about. We see this all over the world still today. The best they can do, though, I like, look at the way he ends it. You've got to pick a tree that doesn't rot. You seek out a craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. You see? Think, let me think about that. The best they can do is try and find an idol that won't topple over. 
you say that's it. You won't, it won't topple over. And think about this again from the Lord's perspective here, and why, he, why Isaiah the prophet, the Lord's prophet, is, is kind of making light of this, but in a serious way. Because here is the Lord. We've just heard him described. He's mighty over all creation. He's the one that measures the heavens, perfect in wisdom and knowledge, sovereign over the nations of the earth, God specifically who is living and active in his creation. This is the God who speaks, the God who hears, the God who guides and redeems and forgives, God full of mercy, loving kindness, and he is ultimately eternal. That is the God. That is the God of Israel. That is the option on the table. Yet, the idol worshipper is concerned with his little crafts thing that he makes, and his biggest concern is that he has to try and make it with skilled craftsmen so that it doesn't fall over. And you see, when, when you put it like that, and you think of it from the perspective of Isaiah here, who, which is thus God's perspective, that's the extent. There's no wonder the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs, that that is what people are replacing him with. And it shows the rebellion of man's heart too. And that is the case with these nations who are threatening Israel. Babylon and Assyria and all these ancient nations, they all, they were run by their gods and their idols. We, we, you can go to a museum and see all of their idols today still. Adorn the gates of their buildings, their city gates, the Ishtar gates in Babylon. I think of those ones, you've seen them, with the big lion, the flying lions on the side of them. That was a representation of their God. These are the kind of things. And God's just looking at that and he's thinking, well, you, you know, you've stolen some of my creation there and you're using it, you know, make your own stuff, kind of. But they can't. He knows this. It's just, the two things are just not comparable. And the whole point that Isaiah is making with all these different uh, questions is to get them thinking about this thing. God, remember, is giving them as words of comfort. So again, the fact that God is a living God should comfort them. Look at verse 21. It says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, he it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judge in the earth of the earth meaningless. Scarcely uh, have they planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth. But he merely blows on them, and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads them forth, uh, leads them forth, host by their number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and his strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. So he again asks this question now, Isaiah. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Expressing really, Isaiah, his disbelief that they've missed this, that anyone can doubt the greatness of the Lord, that anyone would choose to bow down in front of a little crafted statue that doesn't topple over when they have the option of worshipping the great God of Israel. Do you not know? Have you not heard? This has been declared from the beginning, it says. God did not hide himself from his people. From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, he was a God that showed himself because he wanted to fellowship with them, walking with them in the garden. And also the creation showed his power. Romans 1.20 since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. God has revealed himself in those ways to us. Ultimately, in the Messiah is his ultimate uh, revelation of himself. But all these things have been made known to the nation of Israel in many ways. And it goes on again now to describe it's God who sits above the heavens, above the circle of the earth and stretches out the heavens. This is get, basically saying that he is separate from his creation. That's the point. Because all of these people, all of these idols that they're worshipping, they're not separate from creation. They're just parts of creation that they're using and choosing to worship them. The point here is that God is transcendent. He is the creator of the universe, the cause of the universe, and thus he has authority over the universe. To him, the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. And he's speaking of those who... Like, like the nations, Assyria and Babylon at this time, are, are in rebellion against him, those who are worshipping, worshipping idols. He says they're rulers and judges of the earth, they're nothing to him. And we, again, we think about this today, dictators, despots, criminals, whatever they may be, the Lord is not worried about them in some ways. He says the Lord merely has to blow on them to remove them, which is exactly what we'll see him do to destroy the Antichrist in, in years to come. That's the same way it's described there. Isaiah reminds them again, verse 25, to whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, 
says the Holy One. Again, another uh, pointed question to them. It's the second time he's asked this question. He's really trying to get them to think about this. There is no one who can even compare to being likened to God. And there's no equal, there's no close second, there's no third, there's nothing. Because everything else is in the created order. And God is outside of the created order. He is, in fact, the creator. That fact alone is something that should bring comfort to Israel because God has declared he is for them. And he wants to be uh, them to be his people and dwell with them. Verse 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and of the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Basically, in answer to his own question, he's saying, if you still need an answer, when he says, to whom I to be likened, is there any equal to me? If you need an answer, if it's not obvious, basically, is what he's saying, Isaiah suggests, take a look at the stars. Look up at the stars. Maybe start counting them. And when you tire of that task, when you realise that that really is kind of impossible, then you can realise that the God is the one who created them. And he's so great. He didn't just create them. It almost says that he knows them all individually, even by name. Millions upon millions upon millions of them, you see. This is God. This is their God. And again, it's making this point how far above and how great God is. He is the one there. What does it say? Because of the greatness of his might, strength, and power. He is the one who contains that might, strength, and power. Not the empires of the day, not the idol worshippers, not the princes, not the rulers, not the judge, not Nebuchadnezzar, not Sennacherib that we've seen all so far in Isaiah, the Lord. And all the Lord asked is that his people acknowledge that, and none of these things would have ever been a problem to them. But it also shows us, as, as we all know too well, the deceptive nature of sin, the subtle strategies of Satan that cause us to doubt that and to listen to other things. He says, not one of them is missing. And I like that. It's kind of just, again, he hasn't, nothing has fallen by the wayside in God. There's no little part of the universe or of his creation that he, he's forgotten about in that sense or that he's unaware of. There's no secret sort of shadow area that the Lord doesn't know what's going on. That's often how we think, don't we? Not, it's not the underworld ruled by Satan and his minions that he doesn't have control over. The Lord knows and is in charge of all. He says, why do you say, verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God. Do you not know, have you not heard, notice that question again, do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired, his understanding is inscrutable. You know, as Isaiah has so many lovely quotable verses, doesn't he? Uh, it's one of the most quoted books for that reason. Now, Isaiah applies this now. So we've seen this beautiful exposition of these attributes of God asked in the form of these questions to the nation, and now he's applying it. He applies it to the nation, asking them why, in light of God's greatness, God's wisdom, God's power, God's provision for them, they assume, because they made this, this claim earlier in the book, that the Lord does not see their actions and live, that the Lord's going to let them get away with these things. They assume that they will escape justice. And again, now he's, he's coming back to kind of the first half of the book where we've seen uh, these things going on. It's kind of like Israel, they kind of know about God, the God of Israel. They, they're the nation of Israel, you know, they had, had all the, the worship, but they were living in many ways like atheists. They weren't trusting God, they were going to the other nations, they were doing everything wrong. They were living like the pagans, basically, at that time, even though they, in, in name, claimed to be the nation of Israel. And whilst it's easy to look back and in light of this description of God and everything like that, think how silly that is. I think it's very, we, again, we must be, mustn't be quick in judging Israel. All of these things are a lesson for us. We often do the same, don't we? It's very easy to affirm that God exists with your Christian faith, intellectually assent to it, and, and in your heart believe it, I believe. But still, with all of that, it's very easy also to actually practically live your day-to-day -day life like those things are insignificant. Um, which just means we, we often go through the motions of our lives. Sometimes we don't really think that he, he wants to be involved in that or he, he has the, the motivation to maybe do or be involved in these sort of things or we doubt his influence in certain areas. And in many ways, that's a lack of trust in God. At the same time that we still believe he exists, we're not denying God, but it's, it's a practical aspect of living out your faith. It's very easy to, to live 
sort of just normally, you know, the world, everything keeps spinning and the clocks keep ticking and life goes on and it's easy to fall into that routine. Uh, we've all probably been there in, in life at some point. But again, this is a reminder, God is asking that question, why, O Israel? Why are you living like that when I am here knocking on your door, basically? Do you not know? Have you not heard? And then that wonderful description, the everlasting God. And he emphasizes this, I believe, to emphasize the point that God, like Jesus said, God is never going to leave you, never going to forsake you. He's the beginning and the end, thus he is there from the beginning of the end of your life. All your days are numbered, every hair in your head is numbered. This is God's protection, the everlasting God, the Lord. That's Yahweh, that's the, the name that is revealed to Moses, the eternal one. The creator, that's the one with all the power, the one that speaks things into existence. He does not become weary or tired like you, basically, in that sense. He understands everything. Again, Isaiah emphasizing the uniqueness and uh, incomparable nature of God. And then we have these wonderful final three verses, which see the benefit of such a Lord to their people. Let's read, uh, let's just finish, finish the chapter. It says, he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Probably one of the most famous verses in the book of Isaiah there. I'm sure you've seen that on a fridge magnet, on a postcard, on all sorts of Christian tact and paraphernalia. Uh, I have many of them, but that is true. It's a, it's a very quotable verse, but let's, let's look at the two before it and we'll come to that verse. So he says he gives his strength to the weary. And what does it mean by weary? It means that those that look to him to increase their power. And remember, this is all in the backdrop of mighty empires challenging God and people rebelling against him. But those who look to him, he will give his power. The ones who lack, these are the ones that acknowledge that they need God, not the ones who are trying to do things in their own strength. Those who consider themselves wise and strong will not get that strength. The youths who, who are doing things in their own strength, it's saying here, basically. They will not get the strength. The strength is for the humble. It's Jesus is basically the same old principle. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and, and that's, that's the idea here. But then verse 31. It's a wonderful verse. It quotes so well. Remember, primarily the context here is to the nation of Israel, but I, I have no problem in, in making a universal application to it, to all God's people in all eras. Given to the nation, remember, when a time of judgment was coming, when living was probably again going to get very hard, and we know from the rest of the Old Testament living did get very hard again. The nation was uh, taken into captivity and was never really the same again after that. They are exhorted to wait and trust the promises of God for the already promised deliverance that ultimately would come through the Messiah and ultimately will still be fulfilled in his kingdom. But this was their promises. The trust that this will give them is what gives them their strength. It's a supernatural strength. It makes them, and the expression, the lovely expression there, mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not get tired. Uh, mounting up or soar, your Bible might say, soaring with wings. It's, it's the idea, if you picture a bird in flight, big bird and they're high and they're, they're not even flapping their wings you know they're just whoosh, gliding that's the picture Effort, it almost looks effortless doesn't it that's the idea that we have being presented here your trust in the Lord uh, will make it like that in some ways it's a supernatural thing just as for us now this is Israel remember let's make an application we could say that we live in exile from heaven in many ways. Our citizenship is already transferred to heaven. We're described as strangers and exiles in this fallen and broken world, waiting for the day of redemption, looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We're called to wait for that redemption, just as Israel was called to wait for that coming redemption and exercise faith in the same way. And in fact, ultimately, we share the same promises of a future kingdom that we will be uh, living in with the Lord. We have those same promises. We have the same... Uh, redemption that we're waiting for we're called to live like that too so the question of this verse really comes down to what does waiting mean here because if you've ever read the bible you'll know that this concept of waiting on the lord is a big one in the christian world it's a big concept but it's often well i challenge anyone to explain it simply it's not a simple concept because we all know it doesn't just mean sitting and watching the clock, which is generally how we assume waiting, don't we? In, in, if you're waiting for something to start, 
this is not what it's talking about here. So let's just explore this a little bit before we close. I'll give you four things that I believe are involved in waiting, biblical waiting as we're calling it here, in the Lord. The first thing, it means that we should long for the Lord. Waiting involves longing for the Lord. And what I mean by that is that we seek the Lord, we desire the Lord, and we admit that we need the Lord in this life. If you're not doing those things, you're not going to be waiting for the Lord. Okay? Because it's, it's, it's held out as the greatest thing you could ever wait for, the blessed hope, the glorious appearing. If you don't desire that, you're not going to be waiting for that. Okay? It's not going to have an impact on your life. So the first thing, the first part of waiting means that you long for the Lord. The second part of waiting, I would say, means that you listen to the Lord. You listen to the Lord. Proverbs 8.34, blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, watching at my doorposts. The picture here is of someone just standing so close to the Lord's house that if he says a word, he hears it. He's desperate for that word, desperate for the word of God. You listen to the Lord. And again, if you're not waiting, watching daily at the gates like that, you're not waiting on the Lord. It doesn't matter what you're doing in, in this life, if these are two things that waiting on the Lord means. That means we can be busy with our own work and going through all the different things, whether it's health or sickness or whatever it may be, joy or trouble, persecution or, or you know, abundance or poverty, whatever it may be, we still need to be waiting on the Lord. So we listen to the Lord, and we desire the Lord. And the third thing I would say is looking to the Lord. And this is different to the first one I said, where, where we should desire the Lord. What I mean by looking to the Lord is that you look to the Lord for your supply, for your needs, for your sustenance. Just like the nation of Israel were ta ca caught, taught to desire, uh, wait on the Lord for their food in the wilderness. But also more than just physical things, you look to the Lord for strength, for sustenance, for guidance, for direction, for counsel, for comfort, for all of these things that the Bible says the Lord offers to us. Again... If you're not doing this, you're not really waiting on the Lord because these are, the, these are basically the things that the Lord offers to you. And even though we don't get them to the full degree as when we're going to be with him face to face, we still have this relationship with him. I think that's a big part of it, looking to the Lord. We're commanded, aren't we? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Just like they had to look at the bronze serpent of Moses that, that was lifted up in the desert to them and they were saved. We look in faith to the Lord for everything that we have. He has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness that we can live in this world. And then the final, the fourth thing, not the final, way you could probably multiply this list, but I just picked four. The fourth thing it means, waiting on the Lord means also living for the Lord whilst you're waiting. You see what I mean? So it's not, it's not a passive waiting that we're doing, it's an active waiting that we're doing. Because we're waiting in his service. It basically means we serve the master. And how do we do that? By applying the truths that we know while we wait. You see, because the Lord, what you're waiting for, what it's saying, waiting on the Lord, is you're waiting ultimately for the fulfillment of the Lord's promises in, in the world and in your life personally, but in the world. And if you're not serving him, why on earth would you want to enter a kingdom where we're going to serve him for all eternity? You see, so this, it, like it's, this is the kind of thing that we have here. You wait for someone you desire, you wait for someone that you listen to, you wait for someone that you look to as the ultimate sustainer of your life, and you wait for someone that you are actively serving as a believer. That is what we do. That is just, I believe, a glimpse, maybe, of what it means when it says we wait on the Lord. We serve the Master and apply those truths while we're waiting. And you could, you could, we could have really done a whole... I did, when I was studying this, I did think I should save that verse and do a whole, a whole session on that, but then I thought... We've been, it's our fourth session in this chapter, we, we need to finish and we're having a break after that, so it's a nice clean break. Let me read to you just one old quote from a guy called Thomas Brooks, he was an old 17th century Puritan. He wrote this, it's an exhortation that he wrote on waiting. It's why he puts it wonderfully. He says, waiting souls, remember this, assurance is yours, but the time of giving, it is the Lord's. The jewel is yours, but the season in which he will give it is in his own hand. The golden chain is yours, but he only knows the hour wherein he will put it around your neck. Well, wait patiently and quietly. Wait expectantly and believingly. Wait affectionately and wait diligently. And you shall find that scripture made good with power upon your souls yet a little while, and he shall come and will come and will not tarry. The mercies of God are not styled by the swift, but the sure mercies of David, and therefore a gracious soul patiently waits for them. 
You see, I believe this is the sort of waiting that Isaiah is talking about. It is this sort of waiting where you will be met with that supernatural strength that will cause you to renew, to be renewed and cause you to soar effort, effortlessly like the eagle does, to run and not get weary. It's supernatural and ultimately it's talking about that which comes when you are the Lord's. You're living for him, you're submitted to him. And it's not saying that you don't mess up, but it's saying you avail yourself of the grace that is available, which again is part of following the Lord. So this is the final, you think of this wonderful sermon basically that Isaiah has given them here. He extols all of these attributes of God, his greatness in power, in creation, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, his sovereignty over the nations, uh, uh, he's a living God as in comparison to idols, the folly of idol worship, and then asking the question, so why in light of all this are you not worshipping me? And then he's finishing off by saying, because when you're, when you're mine, you avail yourselves of my supernatural power, and you'll get this strength and this renewed vigour to serve me and wait for the deliverance and ultimate final fulfilment of all of these promises, which is the same as he would say to us too. That is the application, the practical benefit of acknowledging all that Isaiah has said about God and putting it into practice. And I think the charge is for us to do the same. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we, we just thank I thank you for this 40th chapter of Isaiah, Lord. We've spent four hours in it, or, well, four sessions in it, Lord, and it's been wonderful. We thank you that your word uh, could just be mined over and over and you would still get new truth from it. Pray now that you'd help us to put these things into practice. Help us to, to have that attitude and understanding towards you, Lord. And help us to serve and live and wait on you and to be renewed and be given that supernatural strength, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.